Good evening and welcome to all of you wherever you happen to be. Tonight we have more than 400 people registered for this virtual lecture by Professor Victor Peskin on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Why have the peace efforts failed so far? I'm Chava Tiror Samuelson and I'm the Director of Jewish Studies as well as Irving and Miriam Lowe, Professor of Modern Judaism and Regents Professor of History here at ASU. Those who have attended our programs in the past know that in addition to undergraduate and graduate courses, and we also offer a major and a certificate in Jewish studies, we do conduct a very robust public education program in which we explore and present the Jewish civilization from antiquity to the present. We cover religious, cultural, literary, political, social, economic, scientific, and medical aspects of the Jewish experience, and we employ diverse academic disciplines to do it. Although our public lectures, seminars, workshops, conferences, and exhibits have engaged many topics, we are always committed to the historical perspective. We are convinced that there is no way to understand the present let alone anticipate, anticipate the future without awareness of the past. Historical awareness and historical research thus undergird everything we offer to the public for the purpose of generating new knowledge and contributing to the quality of contemporary Jewish life. Historical knowledge is especially crucial in these difficult days when we are coping with the tragic events in Israel. As we all know, on October 7th, Hamas militants launched unprovoked murderous attack on Israeli civilians, destroying 23 settlements that border the Gaza Strip. Violating Israel's sovereignty, Hamas terrorists ran over the border, murdered hundreds of youth who took part in a celebration to mark the end of Sukkot. They also raped girls and women, slaughtered babies, abducted old men and women, looted homes, and destroyed property. Over 1,400 were killed, over 230 people taken hostage, families were torn apart, and communities were devastated. A few basic facts about Hamas might be useful to keep in mind. Hamas is the Arabic acronym of the Islamic resistance movement. It was founded in 1987 by Ahmed Yassin as part of the First Intifada, the Palestinian uprising against Israel's control of what is known as the West Bank, which Israel conquered in the Six Day War of 60, 1967. In 1973, Ahmed Yassin established in Gaza an Islamic charity that was linked to the Egyptian based Muslim Brotherhood. An, Islamic, an Islamist movement that was founded in Egypt in 1928 by Hassan al-Banna. Hassan al-Banna rejected Western imperialism and modernization of Egypt as much as he was critical of secular Arab nationalism. Instead, al-Banna preached Islamist revival and the creation of new religious institutions rooted in the teachings of Islam. In 1949, the Muslim Brotherhood established a branch of uh, this kind of branch in Palestinian refugee camps of Gaza. Some, somebody is trying to reach me here. Uh, Lisa, please contact Laura Ruskind. Okay. So in 1949, the Muslim Brotherhood established a branch in the Islamic refugee camps of the Gaza Strip. Those camps were temporarily designed to house refugees of the 1948 war. Now, let me remind you that the war of 1948, which Israel regards as its war of independence, it started when the nascent state of Israel was attacked by five armies of Arab states, namely Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, and Egypt. A few days after Israel declared its independence following the end of the British mandate in May 1948. Israel won the war of independence, but with a very high price. One percent of its population at the time, which was about 6,000 people out of 600,000 people, died in the war. 
The war, as we all know, took place three years after the Holocaust and the state of Israel came into existence. You cannot understand the, emerge, the establishment of the state of Israel without bringing the Holocaust to mind as well. But the war of 1948 was also the beginning of the Palestinian refugee problem. And they regard the same events in 1948 as what they call Nakba, namely catastrophe, by which they refer to mass displacement and dispossession. Now, there are many reasons why the Palestinian refugee problem, problem has not been resolved until now. And I can only count a few things that come to my mind. Uh, the geopolitics of the Middle East, poor management of the refugee camps by the UN, uh, the determination of the refugees to return to their own homes prior to 1948, the adaption of terror since 1964 as the primary means to achieve political goals and the increased militarization of the conflict, the use of, I should say, cynical use of the Palestinians by Arab states as a proxy to achieve their own geopolitical goals, the internal divisions within the Palestinian leadership and the corruption of some of its leaders, and uh, since 1967, also the internal debate within Israel about the goals of Zionism and the possibility of coexistence with the Palestinians. As you know, the, the settlement movement began after 1967 and it, the settlers occasionally engage in violent interaction with their Palestinian neighbors. So all these and many more factors could be brought to mind why this has not been successful so far. Why, in other words, why there has been no way to solve the Palestinian refugee problem. The critical point to keep in mind that for 75 years, Israel has been fighting for its existence both against sovereign Arab nations or states, as well as against non-state actors who are trying to gain statehood, namely the Palestinians. So the Sinai War of 1956, the Six Day War of 1967, the Yom Kippur War of 1973, the First Lebanon War of 1982, the Second Lebanon War of 2006, as well as the First Intifada of 1987 and the Second Intifada of 2000, all of these have been bloody conflicts in which the reality of Israel's existence has been challenged either by Arab states or by the Palestinians who are trying to get their self, their political self-determination. I would like to remind all of us that the interests of Arab states and the interests of the Palestinians are not identical. They only overlap to some extent. And yet, despite the perpetual conflict of the past 75 years, there have been persistent efforts to reach peace between Israel and, and its Arab neighbors and to address the Palestinian refugee issues. Israel has signed peace accord with Egypt 1979, with Lebanon 1983, with Jordan 1994. And in recent years, Israel has signed peace treaties with Morocco, that's 2020, with Sudan also in 2020, and with the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain in 2021. In the past few months, Israel has been in conversation with Saudi Arabia on the normalization of relations. And this is precisely the reason why Hamas chose to attack Israel at this point. So these peace efforts have been conducted under the auspices of the United States, Israel's staunch supporter. But the persistent attempts also came at a high cost when courageous leaders on both sides Sadat, Anwar Sadat, the president of Egypt, and Yitzhak Rabin, the prime minister of Israel, were assassinated. The first was assassinated in 1981, and the second in 1995. So these people were assassinated by others who did not want to see normalization of relations and peaceful coexistence between Israel and Arab states, or Israel and the Palestinians. We are very fortunate to have with us tonight Professor Victor Peskin from ASU to shed light on this very complex and painful story. Let me introduce Professor Peskin. He's an associate professor in the School of Politics and Global Studies at ASU. He received a PhD in political science from UC Berkeley and his scholarship pertains to the intersection of international relations, comparative politics and human rights. <clears throat> 
His research and teaching examine the politics of the contemporary international criminal tribunals and their contentious relationship with states who are that are implicated in war crimes and genocides. Professor Peskin is the author of Rwanda and the Balkans, Virtual Trials and its Struggle for State Cooperation that came out by, uh, University of, by Cambridge University Press in 2009. And he's the author of various essays that appeared in many um, distinguished journals in his field. So before he starts with his presentation, I would like uh, all of us uh, to pay attention to one thing. We are committed to understanding this complex history of the conflict, and we wanna do so in a very civil manner that respects divergent views and conflicting interpretations. Please place your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And since we have uh, a lot of people, we probably won't be able to accommodate all of us. We'll do our best uh, to uh, um, address as many questions as we can. And now, Professor Peskin, the screen is yours. Hava, thank you very much. And thanks to all of you, over 200, um, who are here tonight. And a special thank you to the Center for Jewish Studies for conceptualizing and organizing tonight's event. Several weeks ago, when Hava contacted me to invite me to participate in this event, I hesitated. And I did so for several reasons. First, it's been a long time, almost a decade, since I've really been immersed in studying and teaching about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And second, as we all know, this conflict and this war is so fraught, so complex, and so confounding. Discussions about the conflict and the war are filled with metaphorical landmines to such an extent that language itself, as well as expressions of empathy, have become landmines. Consequently, many people within and far beyond the university setting feel it's wiser to avoid the topic altogether. But when a conversation becomes a landmine, then understanding the conflict and envisioning a way out of this conflict certainly becomes impossible. So yes, I could have said no to the invitation, just as all of you could have said no, but it's important that we are all here tonight. This month, the world has witnessed and the people of Israel and Gaza have lived and died through some of the worst violence to convulse the region in the last century. The latest war as Hava, and as we all know, start, started with a surprise attack by Hamas, a horrific attack on 23 Israeli communities in southern Israel, which led to the massacre of more than 1,400 people, most of whom were civilians, many elderly, many children, babies included. Um, Hamas, whose charter calls for the destruction of the state of Israel, also has kidnapped what appears now to be a higher number, 239 Israelis and foreigners. The New York Times calls the situation the world's most complicated hostage crisis in recent memory. Moreover, the October 7 attack represents the single greatest loss of Jewish life on any day since the Holocaust ended 88 years ago. An Israeli major general described the grim scene of slaughter at Kafar Aza, one of the border communities attacked by Hamas in the following way. This is quoted from the New York Times in an October 10th article. It's something I never saw in my life, something more like a pogrom from our grandparents' time. The Hamas attacks have been followed by an unprecedented Israeli military assault against Hamas in the Gaza Strip and in the last days, the start of what appears to be a major ground offensive. As part of its bid to destroy Hamas, the Israeli Defense Forces ordered a complete siege of Gaza, cutting off fuel, water, and food. More than 1 million Gazans, today the estimate from the UN is 1.4 million, of uh, a total population in Gaza of between 2.1 to 2.3 million people have been displaced. And the health system, according to the UN and the World Health Organization, is on the brink of collapse. The Hamas-run Gaza Health Ministry estimates that more than 8,000 people have been killed in the bombings. 
This humanitarian crisis in one of the world's most densely populated areas has far, exceed the, has far exceeded the magnitude of the crises in Gaza sparked by the previous wars fought between Israel and Hamas since 2008. The war has also sparked intense debate on college campuses in the UN Security Council and elsewhere regarding the legal, moral, and strategic implications of the ongoing fighting. Prominent international human rights organizations have condemned Hamas attacks, categorizing them as war crimes and even crimes against humanity. Israel's attack and the siege itself have also been criticized by human rights bodies, including by the European Union High Representative for Foreign Affairs, Joseph Burrell, as violating international law. There has been some humanitarian aid allowed to enter through the Rafa boarding crossing, but international officials say this is only a trickle of what is needed for the civilian population. Israel defends its offensive by citing its legal right to self-defense and by arguing that its offensive abides by international law and follows the rules of proportionality. The Israeli government in this war, as in others, blames Hamas for establishing command centers and hospitals and in other civilian installations. This, says Israeli officials, is a cynical strategy Hamas deploys to use Gazans as human shields, which itself is a violation of international law, in order to direct international outrage at Israel when civilian casualties occur. Western states, and especially the US, have strongly backed Israel's offensive, but have also underscored the importance of Israel limiting civilian casualties and following international law. The question of civilian casualties and the laws of war more generally are being closely scrutinized and is becoming an aspect of the conflict itself. Just this weekend, International Criminal Court Chief Prosecutor Karim Khan on a visit to the Rafa boarding pro border crossing at the Gaza-Egypt border announced that his office has initiated an investigation into alleged violations of international humanitarian law in Israel, Gaza, and the West Bank since October 7. And finally, the crisis has spilled over to the West Bank, which falls under partial Israeli occupation and under the partial control of the moderate Palestinian Authority. Since October 7, more than 100 Palestinians have been killed, including some by extremist Israeli settlers. The deteriorating situation in Israel-Palestine now threatens a wider war with Syria, the Iranian-backed Hezbollah militia in Lebanon, and with Iran itself. This is a grim summary of where we are today. But the purpose of my talk is to look back, which I hope will form a basis for beginning when the time is right to look forward. My aim tonight is twofold. First, to provide a brief overview of the long arc of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Second, to focus on examining some of the reasons why attempts over the last three decades to reach a comprehensive political set settlement have largely failed. Studying the history of the peace process, of course, cannot magically solve the current predicament that we are in. But understanding the contested histories of this conflict may go some way to illuminating the obstacles to a sustainable peace. In 2012, 2013, I spent a year in Jerusalem on a sabbatical fellowship. And I subsequently conducted interviews with Israeli and Palestinian officials, academics, other experts, and several former US peace negotiators. I did so as part of my research into examining the political implications on the peace process of the Palestinian Authority's attempts to trigger an international criminal court investigation of the Israeli government's settlement policies in the West Bank and its military conduct in previous Gaza wars. Over the last several weeks, I thought back to a 2014 interview I conducted in Ramallah with Mohammed Shataya, who had served as prime minister of the Palestinian Authority before quitting in frustration with the stalled peace process. In the interview, he recalled that as a child, he struggled to understand how the 100-year war in Europe long ago, like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict itself, 
could have lasted so long. And then as an adult and a Palestinian leader, he came to wonder the same thing about the Israeli-Palestinian process. And here I quote the prime minister, the former prime minister. When I look at it, I'm amazed that this peace process has been going on for 23 years with no resolution, he told me, referring to what has been known as the Oslo peace process. And I heard similar sentiments from many Israelis as well. Let's begin with a brief, although admittedly incomplete overview of the conflict. Beginning in the early 1880s, Jews in Eastern Europe, part of an emerging Zionist movement to establish a Jewish homeland in the land of Israel, sought to just do that, return home. Many Jews were fleeing virulent anti-Semitism. This anti-Semitism took the form of persecution and deadly pogroms. Initially, there were four ways of Jewish immigration lasting from 1882 through the end of the 1930s. This was followed by another wave of immigration in the aftermath of World War II and the Holocaust. In this stage, tens of thousands of Jews, many of them war refugees and many of them Holocaust survivors, left Europe to build a new life in what was then British-controlled Palestine. Given Britain's severe restrictions on legal Jewish immigration during this period, approximately 50,000 Jewish refugees bound for Palestine were intercepted by the British and interned in detention camps in Cyprus and also in Israel. For instance, in Adlit, a detention camp south of Israel, south of Haifa in Israel, which I visited. In the aftermath of Israeli independence in 1948 and the Israeli victory in the 1967 war, the majority of the approximately 1 million Jews who had lived in Arab countries for generations and generations left their homes or were expelled, settling in Israel. During the period of early immigration to Palestine and until the 1948 war, Palestinians were in the clear majority, having lived there for centuries, generations upon generations. By the 1920s, Jews in Palestine had formed a clear vision of a future state with a Jewish majority. And in 1917, British Foreign Minister Balfour issued a declaration that acknowledged the right of the Jewish people to create a, quote, national home in Palestine. At the time, Britain ruled Palestine under a League of Nations mandate, and Britain had wrested control from the Ottoman Empire of Palestine in 1917. Under the British mandate, Jews in Palestine would be granted the right to establish a para-state entity that came to be known as the Jewish Agency. This entity formally cooperated with the British and was entitled to some level of diplomatic representation in the League of Nations. However, the Palestinians, who also developed a state of their own, did not obtain a similar representative leadership body under the auspices of British rule. The British did offer the Palestinians such a para-state representative institution if they would accept the British mandate and the terms of the Balfour Declaration. The Palestinians rejected these terms. Now, in 1936 to 1939, there was the Arab Revolt, which constituted a major Palestinian uprise against British rule, as well as Br the British support for a national home for the Jewish people. Britain's eventual suppression of the revolt greatly weakened the Palestinian movement for self-determination. The crushing of the rebellion and the failures of Palestinian leadership, as well as the lack of Palestinian state structures, would come later in the 1948 war to undermine Palestinian prospects for a state of their own. This analysis is detailed further by Columbia University professor Rashid Khalidi in his book, the Iron Cage, the story of the Palestinian struggle for statehood. In the aftermath of the Arab revolt and with a looming war in Europe, Britain felt the need to provide concessions to the Arabs of Palestine. The so-called 1939 white paper pledged to address two longstanding Palestinian demands, limiting Jewish land purchase and limiting Jewish immigration. The white paper also constituted a major concession to Palestinians, 
by providing in the future for an independent Palestinian state and placing a Jewish national home within that state rather than granting the Jews of Palestine a fully independent state of their own. The white paper was strongly opposed by Jewish leaders who viewed it as antithetical to their own hopes for statehood. Some moderate prominent Palestinian leaders advocated for their acceptance of the white paper, while many Palestinian rebel fighters who had been rebel fighters in the Arab revolt opposed the British proposal. In the end, Palestinian leaders rejected the white paper, a decision in Khalidi's view that despite, quote, its ambiguity on key provisions did not prove advantageous to them, that is to the Palestinians. So this appeared to be, although not a perfect compromise by any means, and there was some doubts among Palestinians about the trustworthiness of this British proposal in the white paper, it did seem to be an opportunity to resolve or at least meet some of their own uh, desires to establish a state of their own. Um, even well before the late 1930s, it was apparent that the quest for a Jewish state came in direct conflict with a parallel Palestinian push for a nation state. So the genesis of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict derives from two peoples seeking nation states of their own in the same geographical space. In the 1940s, a concerted guerrilla movement of several Jewish underground organizations focused on driving the British out of Palestine. This is in the aftermath of World War II. By early 1947, this campaign against British rule proved successful, leading Britain to announce its intention to leave, to quit Palestine. In June 1947, a UN commission visited Palestine and two months later, the commission determined that the best course of action was to divide Palestine into two states rather than having all Jews and Arabs live together in a single state. And now um, I am going to show a slide um, this I will explain presently. On November 29th, 1947, the United Nations General Assembly adopted Resolution 181, authorizing the creation of a two-state solution on the territory of British Palestine that lay to the east of the Jordan River. West of the Jordan River. The so-called UN Partition Plan allocated approximately 43.53% of the territory comprising present-day Israel, Gaza and the West Bank for a Palestinian state. And meanwhile, Israel would be granted 56.47% of the territory. Jerusalem would be governed by the UN Trusteeship Council with Jews and Arabs being guaranteed access to religious sites and minorities remaining in either state being assured of fair treatment. So here we can see uh, an old map of this partition plan with uh, with the envisioned future state of Israel in the teal and the envisioned future Palestinian state um, in the orange. And around Jerusalem, you see a white area to indicate international control of Jerusalem. Um, Jewish leaders in Palestine accepted the UN partition plan. Israel's first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion, referring to the global legitimacy bestowed on the state of Israel from the UN plan, said he knew of no greater achievement by the Jewish people in its long history since it became a people. However, Arab states and Palestinian leaders rejected the partition plan, criticizing it for a number of reasons, including for what they felt was not dedicating enough land to Palestinians who at the time had a greater population than did the Jews of Palestine. Six months later, in May 1948, the British left Palestine. And as the British departed, Jewish leaders declared the formation of a Jewish state, Israel. Neighboring Arab states immediately, immediately declared war and invaded Israel. Thus, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict became embedded in a larger Israeli-Arab conflict. 
The war came to an end with the signing of several armistice agreements in the first half of 1949, which to be clear, were not peace treaties. The armistice established the so-called Green Line, which um, we, you don't see the Green Line per se, but it's, it's embedded there, I'll explain it. Um, it established the so-called Green Line, which delineated the territory of the new Israeli state, as well as the territory controlled by Egypt and what was then called Transjordan, but today is called Jordan. Transjordan took control of what today is known as the West Bank, while Egypt controlled the Gaza Strip. Transjordan also controlled Jerusalem's old city, yet Israel emerged from the war victorious with considerably more territory than what had been granted under the UN partition plan. So in the aftermath of the 1948 war, Israel now controlled 78% of what had once been British controlled Palestine. A comprehensive history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict must not only understand the causes, but also the human consequences of the 1948 war. Hava in the introduction mentioned the great toll of, of loss of life on the Israeli side and also the refugee issue. In Israel, this war celebrated as the war of independence fought against invading countries that had rejected the right of Jews to live in a state of their own. However, for Palestinians, the 1948 war remains a collective trauma and is synonymous with the word catastrophe or Nakba in Arabic. During the war, some 700 to 750,000 Palestinians fled or were forcibly displaced from their homes by Israeli fighters. Refugees ended up in the West Bank, elsewhere in Transjordan, the Gaza Strip, Lebanon, Syria, and other countries. Those Palestinians who remained in Israel would in time become Israeli citizens and today comprise approximately 20% of Israel's population. Also today, some 5.9 million Palestinians are eligible for services from the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian refugees in the Near East, also known by, his acro by its acronym UNRWA. This number includes refugees from the 1948 war and their descendants. Of the 2.1 to 2.3 million living in Gaza today, approximately 1.7 million are eligible for UNRWA services. Today, con contestation over the refugee issue remains a major source of conflict within the larger Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Now let's fast forward to 1967. The year 1967 deepened the Israeli conflict as well as the larger Arab-Israeli conflict in the Middle East. In June 1967, in the course of six days of fighting, Israel captured the Golan Heights from Syria, the West Bank from Jordan, and the Gaza Strip and Sinai Peninsula from Egypt. Practically overnight, Israel now controlled the entire territory of what was once called mandatory Palestine to the west of the Jordan River, including Jerusalem. Moreover, the war led to another displacement of Palestinians with about 250,000 fleeing to the part of Jordan not under Israeli control. So here is a map that delineates what is part of Israel proper in the white and what was uh, land conquered in the beige. The Israeli, the Israeli military victory turned Israel into an occupying power over, Palis, power over Palestinians living in the West Bank as well as Gaza. Because of this, the war would radically transform the nature of the conflict as well as parts of the world would regard this conflict. This is explained quite clearly by Baruch Kimberling and Joel Migdal in their book, Palestinians, the Making of a People. After 1948, the two scholars write, the conflict had seemed largely international. The armistice agreements, continuing border tensions, the Suez War in 1956, all these involved sovereign states. From this perspective, both to its own Jewish citizens and to a larger world public, 
Israel seems small and beleaguered, surrounded by much larger hostile states that refused to accept its right to exist. However, after the 67 war, observed Kimmerling and Migdal, quote, the focus gradually shifted back to the communal problem as in the days of the British mandate. That is, two peoples, Jews and Palestinian, claiming the same piece of soil. Israel's image thus shifted, much to the frustration of its supporters from beleaguered to all powerful. Under the law of international armed conflict, victorious militaries are allowed to occupy foreign territory, but for an undefined interim period. That is the intention. However, the occupying power is bound by certain rules. One such rule, codified in the Geneva Conventions, prohibits the occupying power from moving their own citizens into occupied territory. The principle behind this prohibition and the UN Charter more generally is to prevent states from altering international borders through military conquest. While Israel annexed the Golan Heights in 1981, it has not made a formal declaration of sovereignty over the West Bank or Gaza. However, since the 1967 war, the question of Israeli settlement building in the West Bank has been a major source of contestation, not only between Israelis and Palestinians, but also between Israel, the United States, and the international community. And settlements is something we'll talk more later on in the presentation as well. Not long after this war, the legal counsel of the Israeli foreign ministry wrote an internal memo advising Israeli officials that settlements in captured territory violated international law, specifically the Geneva Convention. That advice was not heeded, as described by Gershom Gorenberg, by Gershom Gorenberg in his engrossing book, The Accidental Empire, Israel and the Birth of, of the Settlements, 1967 to 1977. The settlement movement, driven by religious settlers who have an expansionist vision of the state of Israel, has been to varying degrees supported by a range of dis different Israeli governing coalitions. And over time, the settlement movement has become an increasingly powerful force in Israeli politics. Even as the 67 war and its aftermath deepened the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as well as the wider Israeli-Arab conflict, it also held seeds for its resolution. In November 1967, the UN Security Council adopted Resolution 242, which would later become a starting point for peace negotiations. Israel supported the resolution because it supported its right, quote, to live in peace with secure and recognized boundaries free from threats or acts of force. Egypt, Jordan, and Syria eventually backed the resolution because it formed the basis of Israel ending its military occupation of territory captured in the 1967 war. Yet in October 1973, war erupted when Egypt and Syria launched a surprise attack on Israel. Israel would go on to win that war and retain control of the Golan Heights and the Sinai Peninsula. In the aftermath of this 1973 war, the UN Security Council adopted Resolution 338, which once again implicitly recognized Israel's right to exist within its post-1948 borders. The first major breakthrough in the larger Israel-Arab conflict occur when, occurred with Anwar Sadat's historic visit to Jerusalem in 1977, which one former US diplomat has called, quote, one of the most audacious, audacious acts of statesmanship in the last century. The subsequent negotiations brokered by our own US President Jimmy Carter led to the famous Camp David Accords and the 1979 settlement that established diplomatic relations between Israel and Egypt based on a peace for land formula. In essence, Israel relinquished the Sinai Peninsula in exchange for peace with Egypt. The Gaza Strip, which had been under Egyptian control between 1948 and 1967, remained under Israeli occupation. The Camp David Accords pointed to the possibility 
that Israel could make peace with its other neighbors and perhaps one day with the Palestinians themselves. The story of the successful Camp David negotiations is compellingly told in Lawrence, Lawrence Wright's excellent book, 13 Days in September, the dramatic story of the struggle for peace. Camp David also pointed to two crucial, crucial factors or ingredients for successful peace negotiation. And this is really important. The first ingredient is having courageous leaders capable of doing two things, making bold and controversial compromises at the negotiating table, and then defending these compromises by campaigning for peace vis-a-vis -vis skeptical and often hostile domestic constituencies. The second ingredient is found in the role of the United States or any other powerful international actor in a position to serve as a credible mediator. And particularly, Camp David underscores the importance of a third party to persuade, pressure, and cajole antagonistic parties to make important concessions. The political representatives of the Palestinians the Palestinian Liberation Organization, or PLO, which was created in 1964, rejected UN Security Council Resolution 242. And they did so in part because the resolution did not include any stated reference to Palestinians or to a future Palestinian state. So while Resolution 242 did point the way for Israel to relinquish the West Bank and Gaza, it made no specific promise to the Palestinians. For two decades from 1948 to 1967, quote, Palestine as a, ge as a geographical entity was done for, observed Thomas Friedman in his classic 1989 book, From Beirut to Jerusalem. Indeed, at the time, the prospects of a Palestinian state seemed very remote. I'm referring to this 19 year period from 1948 to 1967. After all, the territory where Palestinians were living during these two decades was divided between three countries, Israel, Jordan, and Egypt. However, it was Israel's capture of the West Bank and Gaza that gave the idea of Palestinian nationalism new momentum. Quote, paradoxically, notes Friedman, Israel's occupation of the West Bank and Gaza in 1967 put Palestine back together again as a geographical entity and put the Palestinians from the West Bank and Gaza and Israel back together as a single community. Yasser Arafat, the leader of the PLO, became the international symbol of the Palestinian campaign for a Palestinian state through their headline grabbing use of international terror against Israelis, both inside and beyond Israel's borders and the, effectiveness, and the effectiveness of the PLO at linking their campaign for Palestinian self-determination with wider third world struggles for national liberation, the PLO became an important actor in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, particularly in the late 1960s and the early 1970s. Israel and the United States and other Western nations condemned the PLO and other Palestinian factions for terrorist attacks against Israeli civilians and hijackings during this period, including the 1972 murder of 11 Israeli athletes at the Munich Olympic Games. It's important to know somewhat more about the PLO. The PLO had a base of operations in Jordan from which they launched attacks on Israel that began even before the 67 war. In what became known as Black September in 1970, King Hussein of Jordan ordered a bloody crackdown on Arafat and the PLO, whom he feared posed a challenge to his own rule. This resulted in the PLO's banishment to Lebanon. From Lebanon, the PLO continued to launch attacks against Israel, terrorist attacks. Beginning in the late 1970s, this led to several Israeli incursions into Lebanon and ultimately to Israel's major 1982 invasion of Lebanon, which significantly expanded the territorial, territorial reach of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. 
The Israeli defense forces proved unable to militarily vanquish the PLO. However, the PLO emerged greatly weakened, a dynamic which would influence its eventual decision to enter peace negotiations with Israel almost a decade later. Arafat and his fighters were forced from Lebanon to establish a new PLO headquarters, but far afield in Tunisia. Meanwhile, the 1982 Lebanon war for Israel had negative unforeseen consequences, leading to the establishment of Hezbollah, a militia group backed by Iran and Syria that would seek to drive Israel out of Lebanon. Now I want to turn to, as we head to the last third of the talk, I want to turn to a more hopeful time in this conflict. Several factors contributed to a breakthrough in addressing the Israeli-Palestinian impasse through diplomacy and negotiations. First, there was the impact of the Palestinian Intifada, the first Intifada a spontaneous uprising which erupted in late 1987 in Gaza and then quickly spread to the West Bank. The several years long intifada centered around Palestinian protests against Israel's two decade military occupation, a system of external control that sharply curtailed Israeli uh, Palestinian civil and political rights. During the first intifada, Palestinians, and this is debated, not necessarily agreed by, by by people in Israel, many people in Israel, but during the first intifada, at least compared to the second intifada, Palestinians largely avoided using lethal violence, or at least early on in the first intifada. The highly co cohesive and largely grassroots resistance movement, along with Israeli efforts to suppress the movement, sparked sustained international criticism of Israel while fostering sympathy in some international quarters toward the plight of the Palestinians and their calls for a state of their own. The uprising also increased pressure on Israel from the US and the uprising became an important factor in the Reagan administration's decision to recognize the PLO. In the wake of the Intifada, public support in Israel for a negotiated peace with the Palestinians grew, which in turn helped set the stage for is the Israeli government's willingness to engage in peace negotiations. Another factor that set the stage for negotiations occurred with the PLO's 1988 Declaration of Independence. This declaration signaled Palestinian acceptance of Security Council Re Resolutions 242 and 338, and therefore it signaled Palestinian acceptance of Israel's pre-1967 borders on 78% of the territory of what had been British Palestine. This in turn set the stage for the PLO's formal acknowledgement of Israel's right to exist. Whereas the PLO had long claimed all of the ter territory of what had been British Palestine, it now signaled its acceptance, and I'm repeating it because it's very significant or appeared to be at the time. The PLO now signaled its acceptance of a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza. The hoped for Palestinian state for Palestinians, if it ever came about, would comprise 22% of what had been British Palestine. That is less than half of the approximately 45% of the territory that had been on offer with the 1947 UN partition plan that had been rejected. Under the auspices of U.S. Secretary of State James Baker, the U.S. in 1991 initiated a negotiation process in Madrid where representatives from Israel, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, and a joint Jordanian-Palestinian delegation sought to establish a diplomatic opening for future peace talks. For the first time, Palestinians were seated at the negotiating table with their Israeli adversaries. And then, new developments. In the early 1990s, Itzhak Rabin came to power seeking to implement an election pledge to resolve the worsening situation between Israel and the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza that arose during the contentious First Intifada. Now, if, re if, Israelis had, if Israeli leaders had an incentive to continue talking peace 
so did the PLO's Arafat. By mid-1993, as former U.S. ambassador to Israel, Martin Indyk notes in his excellent book, Innocent Abroad, an intimate account of American diplomacy, peace diplomacy in the Middle East, Arafat was, quote, in a desperate hurry to end his political marginalization. And peace negotiations was seen as a good way to end that marginalization. Arafat had been marginalized ever since his forced departure from Lebanon in 1982. Moreover, he was struggling to keep his hold over power in within uh, between Palestinian factions, especially given political competition from the Islamic militant group Hamas, which formed in Gaza in 1988. In addition, Arafat looked for American approval given the withdrawal of Russian support in the wake of the breakup of the Soviet Union, as well as his ill-advised support for Saddam Hussein in the first Persian Gulf War. Back channel talks between Israeli and Palestinian negotiators carried out secretly in Norway produced the September 1993 Oslo Agreement that we all know about. The Oslo Accords were celebrated as the most hopeful moment in a decades-long conflict. The image of Israeli Prime Minister, let's see if we're, uh, oh, uh, this was a map early on of the of post-Egypt um, uh, uh, peace agreement with Egypt, and we'll, we'll go back there. Uh, excuse me for that interruption. Um, so the image of Israeli Prime Minister Rabin and PLO leader Arafat shaking hands in front of the White House with President Clinton standing between them with a gentle hand resting on each of their arms, an image that all of us have probably seen, convinced many that Oslo's promise for a final settlement would in fact take place and that the United States would guarantee its implementation. The Oslo Agreement stipulated establishment of an elected Palestinian interim self-government authority in the West Bank and Gaza Strip for a period not to exceed five years. Thus, a two-state solution was to be implemented by the end of the 1990s. The text of the Oslo Agreement recognized that the time had arrived for both sides quote, and this is quoting the agreement, to put an end to decades of confrontation and conflict, recognize their mutual legitimate and political rights and strive to live in peaceful coexistence existence and mutual dignity and security. At the signing ceremony, Rabin declared the moment for peace was at hand. And this is what he said. Let me say to you, the Palestinians, we are destined to live together on the same soil in the same land, he said, before adding this famous line, enough of blood and tears, enough. Almost immediately, the threat to the Oslo Accords and to the peacemakers themselves became apparent. Hamas denounced the agreement, and many on the vocal far right of the Israeli political spectrum likened the prospect of a Palestinian state to a betrayal of an expansionist vision of Israel. That is an that is in Israel extending significantly into the West Bank. There was also concerns to be sure about what a Palestinian state would mean for the security of Israelis themselves within Israel proper. Um, by the time R Rabin returned home from Washington from the signing ceremony, several Israeli soldiers in Gaza had been killed in Hamas ambushes a foreshadowing of Hamas's use of terrorist attacks to scuttle the peace process and undermine their Palestinian rivals, their moderate Palestinian rivals. Within Israel, a young pro-settler ultra-nationalist in his 20s regarded Rabin's support for Palestinian autonomy, a form of treason. The rising extremist threat within Israel to the unfolding peace, peace process is documented in Dan Efron's searing book, Killing a King, The Assassination of Yitzhak Rabin and the Remaking of Israel. Two years later in November, 1995, this man assassinated Rabin just after a speech he gave to tens of thousands of pro-peace Israelis who had gathered in front of the municipality building 
in the large plaza in front in a rally. This act of extremist violence gravely undermined the momentum for peace, helping to trigger its downward spiral. Extremist violence targeting the peace aspirations of moderate Israeli and Palestinian leaders would pose an ongoing threat to the unfolding negotiation and to the leaders who had put their lives on the line. The risk to peacemakers has already been highlighted in Hava's remarks earlier by the 1981 assassination of Anwar Sadat at the hands of Islamic terrorists still bitter over his signing of Egypt's peace treaty with Israel. In retrospect, it becomes clear that the Oslo framework was undermined by its constructive ambiguity. Constructive ambiguity is a strategy, a term diplomats invoke and use to leave elements of peace accords or other agreements vague in certain ways in order to better navigate around extremely volatile issues. But in the vague language of the Oslo framework of 1993, Constructive ambiguity meant not preempting developments or preventing developments that would come later to undermine trust between the parties and threaten the peace process. Specifically, looking back at it at least, the Oslo Accords were problematic because they did not institute or codify guarantees for Israeli security from Hamas terrorist attacks, nor did the Accords ensure curtailment of settlement building in the West Bank, which was to be set aside for a state for Palestinians. Nevertheless, in the 1990s, the Oslo framework still seemed to have a momentum of its own with some observers noting or hoping that a pro-peace tipping point had been reached. Perhaps the most substantive part of the peace process occurred with the September 1995 signing of the Oslo Two Accords at the White House, again by Rabin and Arafat. The role of the US as the sole global, global superpower at the time appeared to be a positive factor pushing peace forward. Indeed, at least before Rabin's assassination, the mid 1990s seemed to be an optimistic time for the US role as global peace mediator. After all, in 1994, Washington brokered the historic peace agreement between Israel and Jordan. And in the fall of 1995, the US also pushed forward, pushed forward, um, 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 uh, pushed forward um, the successful Dayton peace accords that brought an end to the devastating war in Bosnia. The US and NATO ensured the successful implementation of the Dayton Accords by sending 60,000 heavily armed NATO peacekeepers to Bosnia. But a similar move was never seriously considered by the parties in the Israeli-Palestinian context. The Oslo Agreement provided for a significant measure of Palestinian autonomy by allowing Palestinians to govern major cities and towns in the West Bank. The agreement stipulated that 60% of the West Bank would fall under full Israeli control, that's what's referred to as Area C, um, and, and that Israel would control that area until a final political settlement was reached. Area B would fall under is, uh, Palestinian civil authority, but remain under Israeli military control, while Area A would fall under full Palestinian control. I am wrapping up, so bear with me in not immediately, but I'm getting there. In the aftermath of Rabin's assassination, pro-peace sentiment appeared to give his successor, Foreign Minister Shimon Peres, a clear electoral advantage over Likud candidate Benjamin Netanyahu. But Hamas suicide bombings that murdered scores of Israeli citizens helped turn public sentiment against Peres and the Oslo peace process. Netanyahu, who won in a close election, had strongly opposed the Oslo process. But upon becoming prime minister and facing US appeals, he went on to sign some important follow-up agreements with the Palestinians, including giving up partial control of the city of Hebron. However, during the mid and late 1990s, a final settlement that would have resolved the thorniest issues, guaranteeing security, the final delineation of the border of a future Palestinian state, 
the division of Jerusalem and the issue of refugees, all these issues were deferred. The 1999 election of labor leader Ehud Barak, who dispensed with Rabin's gradualism in favor of moving more decisively toward a final agreement, again sparked renewed hope for peace. After his failed attempt to strike a peace agreement with Syria, Barak and US, US mediators held rushed to hold a peace summit with Arafat before the fast approaching end of Bill Clinton's second term. At preliminary talks in Sweden, there appeared to be some pro progress with Arafat seeming to accept some border concessions and some discussion taking place of taboo issues, including the issue of refugees. Yet at the July 2000 Camp David summit, due to situational dynamics, personalities, and deeper substantive disagreements, it would become clear that striking a final deal posed a huge challenge. In his illuminating book called The Much Too Promised Land, America's Elusive Search for an Arab-Israeli Peace, the veteran US diplomat and peace negotiator, Aaron David Miller explains that, quote, the gap separating the parties at Camp David were enormous and the political and psychological constraints each to close these gaps were exceptionally heavy. For better or for worse, Israeli Prime Minister Barak, whose parliamentary coalition was fraying at the time, was in a big hurry to make a deal. Some analysts believe that by signaling that he was in such a hurry, Barak played into Arafat holding out in the negotiations for more Israeli concessions. In his account of the Camp David talks, Aaron David Miller observed, and he was present at these talks, Aaron David Miller observed that, the, that Barack's urgency, quote, caused his, red, caused his red lines to turn pink time and again, signaling a weak and wily Arafat that he could get more from the Israelis simply by holding out for more. To Barack, his concessions were generous and signal, generous and signaled a good faith effort to seal a fear peace settlement. The proposed peace deal was multi-layered. A central provision would have granted a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza while providing for land swaps to compensate the Palestinians for West Bank territory in which Israelis live in large settlement blocks. In a significant concession, Barak signaled a willingness to drop the insistence that Jerusalem should fall entirely under Israeli control. Arafat balked at Camp David, yet did not offer a counter proposal. Barak, with many Israelis, concluded that there was not a reliable partner for peace on the Palestinian side. Palestinian officials and Arafat argued that the deal on offer was not fair or as fair as it could be to their side. In a last ditch effort, President Clinton in late December 2000 proposed the Clinton parameters, a series of principles to resolve the impasse at the July 2000 Camp David talk several months earlier. The Clinton parameters would have led to the establishment of an independent Palestinian state on 94 to 96% of the West Bank and a state in all of Gaza, with some land swaps, a Palestinian capital in East Jerusalem, Palestinian sovereignty over the Arab quarters of the old city and Arab holy sites in the old city, and the right of return for Palestinians to the new Palestinian state, but not to Israel itself. The Israeli government decided it would accept the parameters as a basis for future negotiations if Arafat would as well. But again, Arafat declined to do so. Some analysts and diplomats look back and fault the US for not pressing the Israelis and Palestinians to make more concessions during this period, like Jimmy Carter had done back at Camp David in the late 1970s. In this regard, it's important to consider the ways in which the US and other powerful international actors have and can still positively shape the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And now I'm going to sum up. The cost of failed peace negotiations does not only produce disappointment. At times, failure at the negotiating table 
can lead to or contribute to terrible bloodshed. After the failed Camp David talks in summer 2000, but while the Clinton administration still worked on reviving a final settlement, the second intifada broke out. Unlike the first intifada, the second intifada uh, was particularly violent, featuring, especially by Hamas, terrible waves after waves of suicide bombings in Israel, killing scores and scores of Israeli civilians. The second intifada, which lasted from 2000 to 2005, was a harrowing time, resulting in the deaths of more than 1,000 Israelis and approximately 5,000 Palestinians. Since the end of the second intifada, there have been different attempts brokered by the US to get both sides back at the negotiating table. And there have been negotiations, but these last two decades have not been kind to the prospects for peace. A huge blow to peace came within a year of Israel unilaterally withdrawing from Gaza in 2005. In 2006, Hamas won elections in Gaza. In the next year, 2007, Hamas violently purged the Palestinian Authority, leaving Hamas in total control of the enclave. The political split between Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, and the, Palis the, the political split between Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, which works closely with Israel on security cooperation to counter the threat of Hamas in the West Bank. This internal Palestinian split has created an enormous obstacle to peace. Indeed, any peace settlement between the Israeli government and the moderate Palestinian Authority would not have led to a resolution of the conflict, or at least not in the near term, because the settlement would not involve Hamas, which calls for the destruction of Israel. Although the Israeli government and the Palestinian Authority still officially support the two-state solution, even before October 7th and the current war, there remained huge barriers to actually arriving at this destination. Some analysts have viewed Palestinian authority autonomy in parts of the West Bank as a hopeful halfway house toward an eventual two-state solution. But others consider the unresolved status of the Palestinian territories, ongoing Israeli settlement construction in the Palestinian territories, and an occupation that denies equal rights to Palestinians in the West Bank while providing them to Israeli settlers as factors that all combine to make a viable Palestinian state increasingly unlikely. Peace has also been imperiled for another reason. The longer the Palestinian Authority comes up short in its efforts to deliver on its promise of a Palestinian state, the more of a political opening Hamas has had to portray itself as the true defender of Palestinian nationalism. This in turn gives Hamas more opportunity to promulgate its extremist ideology and to carry out the kind of horrific violence inflicted on Israel earlier this month. Violence that seeks to negate Israel's right to exist while sparking endless conflict. Thank you for your patience tonight, and I look forward to the forthcoming discussion. Victor, uh, can you see me or hear me? This was wonderful. Thank you so much. What we are going to do now is go to the Q&A. Lisa, can you um, help us here to be sure that we are properly seen by the audience? Yes, just one second. Okay, uh, do you want me to read questions for you or do you think you can handle it directly? Let's look. Uh, sure, um, sure. I'm... Stop, stop sharing your screen. Oh, stop sharing the screen. Okay, screen share, stop. Okay, um, thank you, Hava. Thank you, Lisa. Um, as you wish, I'm um, happy to um, read and select questions. And Hava, of course, feel free then uh, to jump in at any time. Does that sound good? Yeah, that sounds good. You can start from the top and go your, <laughs> okay. your way um, down. Okay, that sounds good. Um, so um, let and me I just would, see. I um, add, um, there's a bunch of people that asked a bunch of different questions. So try to yeah. spread out your answers. If they've as asked one question, that that's kind of what they get. <laughs> Got it. I see what you're saying. Okay, great. 
Um, so look at this question, right? I see there's some people who have more than one question, which is absolutely understandable. Um, okay, so um, let me just, um, and I'm just looking over at them. Um, um, let me just go to one of the early ones. Um, let me go to, hold on just one second. Bear with me, everyone. Uh, so um, I, I'm looking at David Cater's question that I, I think this is uh, in reference to the 1947 UN partition plan. Didn't this include current Jordan which is not showing on the map. Um, uh, I guess I wish that uh, David, we could talk directly just to clarify the question um, that I believe, I Hava may know the full answer to the question. I believe that that this, these, that Transjordan under this plan would still exist as a country to the east of the Jordan River under the UN partition plan, is that right? Yeah, I would say so, yeah. Okay, um, and then let's look at the question. I'll read it in case the audience can't see the question. What can the United States and other Israeli allies do to mitigate such conflict between Israel and Palestine? Military intervention, economic sanctions, political condemnation. Um, again, I wish we could speak directly. I'm. Uh, I'm not sure if to interpret the question as what can be done to solve the larger conflict between Israel uh, and different Palestinian factions or in the in the context of the war. I think that um, during during this very fraught moment, there is very little public discussion of reviving a two state a uh, solution to the conflict, although President Biden has mentioned that in recent days. Um, I think that, um, you know, returning to the Oslo framework is, is likely going to be, at least for the short, probably long-term, uh, the default approach, uh, certainly by Western states, because this was a vision uh, that was set out uh, in the Oslo talks and then also subsequently with the George Bush administration with the roadmap for peace. So there is, and with the Clinton parameters, you could still take the Clinton parameters off of the shelf and dust off the dust. And in theory, that could be the basis for continued talks. Of, of course, um, I'm not naive. I know that the current situation right now is a, is a terrible one uh, for peace, but it's very important to, to figure out a way to get there. There's a lot of discussions and critiques by analysts and others who say uh, that the two-state solution is dead uh, because of the lack of trust. Uh, there's also a lot of criticism as, of Israeli settlement building issues of security, especially now in the wake of this terrible war and the terrible Hamas attack. So if the quest for peace and a two-state solution seemed hard before, now it seems very unattainable. I think that, that there's going to have to be a way um, to, uh, you know, to provide the security guarantees for Israel uh, that is just so crucial uh, for Israel, and there also has to be a way to envision, in, you know, a way where this uh, this future Palestinian state uh, will have as much stateness and viability um, as possible. How do we get there? I don't have the answer um, at this point, but that is the 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 two million dollar uh, question. Um, I am going through, but in the meantime, Hava, if you see a a question, uh -huh. feel free just to you know. 
uh, yeah, you have, you have a, a, a uh, question from Martha Baker, or oh, Backer, uh, in the map on the screen, how, how come Gaza wasn't given to Egypt? They could have had the Sinai to live on as well, and the same with Jordan taking the West Bank. In other words, couldn't the problem be resolved within the existing geopolitical situation rather than creating uh, trying to create the state for the Palestinian. I think that that's what the question is really about. Right. I, you may know much more than I on that, Hava, so feel free to answer. Uh, but um, um, I think one, one important aspect, and I think I only understand one portion of a much more complex answer and question, is that um, the the idea, the vision, the desire for Palestinian self-determination, a state of their own that, that would not be subsumed or a part of another state like Transjordan or Jordan or Egypt. Uh, the development of Palestinian consciousness, uh, especially after the 1967 war, but even dating back to the 30s and the Arab revolt, I think a lot of that dates back to the desire and the campaign and the advocacy among people who saw themselves as, although Arabs, uh, you know, uh, 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 who were distinctly Palestinian. But at one point, I don't know the story of Egypt, but at one point, King Hussein does relinquish a desire to take back the West Bank, right? So yep. in some other situation, you might see, and it's often the case where states don't want to relinquish territory that they once controlled, right? Often in international relations, states want to do all they can to take that territory. But Hava, yeah, feel free yeah, to also no, add. I, I, yeah, I think, I think that's exactly, you, you got it exactly right. I think the point here is to differentiate between Arab nationalism versus Palestinian nationalism. So those are two separate uh, processes I think that there is a question that uh, Carl Goldberg raises to the same uh, to the same point, uh, and I think that most, I should say, perhaps even all Arab states are not interested in helping the Palestinians or absorbing the Palestinians. So Palestinians cannot become citizens of Arab states where they, in fact, work or live for a long time. So there is a real rejection, including in Egypt especially right now, a real rejection of Palestinian presence in those Arab states. So they are kind of, uh, they have to take care of their, of, of their own uh, self-determination uh, desire or, or, or the impetus for self-determination. They're not necessarily getting help from Arab states. So that's what complicates the story. Absolutely, absolutely. Um... We have a lot of excellent questions, um, and um, so there's a there's a multi pronged one here. Uh, okay, there is um, there is a question uh, further down. How does that? application of international law, Geneva Conventions, work between a sovereign nation and a terrorist group? Um, this is a complex question. Um, I'm, I'm not an international lawyer per se, although I study the larger politics around um, international criminal tribunals. Um, Hamas, which is designated as a terrorist organization by the US and the European Union, um, like like a fully sovereign state is bound by the laws of war and you know uh, the laws of war, which is also known as international humanitarian law. So just because they are not a full fledged state does not give them exemption. Uh, the attack, the October seven attack in Israel, uh, uh, experts view this as war crimes and crimes against humanity, um, and um, using human shields, for instance, just because they are a non-state actor or terrorist group does not uh, make them uneligible for investigation and prosecution for violating international law. Um, 
And just like Israel and Israeli defense forces also are obliged uh, to follow um, international law. Um, has another question, has Hamas ever accepted or been in favor of a two-state solution? Uh, I, uh, Hava may, may know the answer to this. I believe the answer is no, uh, given their charter and given um, their, uh, their commitment to destruction of Israel. But that said, I'm not sure if the, if the person asking this question is referring to this, but in recent years, um, analysts and some in the Israeli government have believed that Hamas has been moderating its position and that although uh, it does not acknowledge, has not acknowledged Israel's right to exist, that it had been acting more pragmatically uh, and that it was more interested in governing uh, Gaza than in attacking Israel. So there was that notion uh, that Hamas, despite its deeply seated antagonism toward Israel, was becoming more pragmatic. And I think that was also one of the elements of, of surprise that, that was particularly shocking because, of course, in the October 7th attack, uh, they, uh, you know, dispensed with this pragmatism altogether. So on that point, maybe you can take the question by Carl Goldberg, who asks you, how can you justify calling the PA and Fatah moderate uh, when they have promoted pay for slave policy and have declared that they will never live in, live in peace with Israel? So how do we interpret really what the other side is all about, uh, given the disparity between what they so say, what they do and so forth? I didn't hear one thing about how can we see, or how did I say that the Palestinian Authority is moderate if they- If, if they promote a pay to slay, that's what, pay to slay- Okay, I think- mark policy, that's how he puts okay. it. Okay, I think that the, the question might be referring to a policy in which uh, released prisoners who had been imprisoned by the Israeli authorities for terrorism offenses uh, were given payments of support upon their release. I'm, I'm wondering if it refers to that. I think, yes, that, I so. that, um, that, has, that has justifiably created a lot of bitterness in Israel. And that um, also, um, that's a serious issue that kind of, that has undermined trust. Um, and so, um, you know, when I interviewed the former prime minister of uh, the Palestinian Authority, he also had a long list of complaints. I'm only underscoring this, not to equate those, but to talk about that, uh, that, that the only way out of this is to kind of figure out a way where, where there can be a way to build trust at the negotiating table, right? So one of the reasons he had quit the peace talks, he said, was that Israeli settlement building, which contravened the spirit of this, uh, the peace talks under the Obama administration, you know, eroded what he felt was the confidence needed to, you know, negotiate. And what, what the question I think asks here is also something that, that would also erode trust. Um, and I think that as there's, there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, actions like this that have undermined uh, the negotiations. And so how do we get to a point where both sides negotiating good faith is a very key question. Um, I see uh, Stephen Batalden has a question. So I'd like to uh, read that. Tom Friedman from the New York Times has argued that Prime Minister Netanyahu has needed Hamas so as to undermine the authority of the Palestinian Authority and the idea of a two-state solution. It may be too late to revive the two-state solution, but is there some historical reality to Friedman's point? Um, this is an excellent and penetrating question that Steve poses. I have read some about that, but I have not not gotten to the bottom of it. So I, I wanna just um, 
you know, be, be judicious in my answer. But I think from analysts that I have read um, over the last several weeks and prior to that, there has been observation and criticism of the prime minister, uh, Netanyahu, for, you know, undermining uh, the authority and legitimacy of the Palestinian Authority, um, and again, some of those, um, some of that might be recast by Israeli leaders as a valid criticism of Palestinian Authority actions. So, for instance, earlier I referenced the International Criminal Court has begun an investigation. They actually began another investigation several years ago, um, and my interviews with with Palestinian Authority officials and others really revolved around the Palestinian Authority's kind of use and threatened use of trying to get the International Criminal Court in The Hague to start an investigation, right? Um, so the Israeli government has been strongly opposed to that. Um, and so, um, you know, there's a lot of, there has been, despite the very important ongoing security cooperation between the Palestinian Authority and Israeli security services, there's also a lot of mud being slung, you know, between uh, Israeli and Palestinian leaders. Um, and sometimes that might be done to undermine the legitimacy of the Palestinian Authority. Other times it might be done uh, in the view of Israeli officials to counter what they believe is undermining action from the Palestinian Authority. So in the case of the Palestinian Authority's efforts to bring the ICC, the International Criminal Court, into this arena, um, that's one example. But yes, I have heard, I have heard that critique, um, and I just need to understand that more uh, about trying to play off the different two main Palestinian factions against each other. Um, I so, think if there's any lesson, uh, from the conflict, it's hard to draw any one lesson, but supporting the moderates is a very important lesson. Uh, moderates don't always do everything in a moderate way, uh, but the alternative uh, is extremism, and um, which is far worse. Yeah, so on that, very, uh, just... Um... To elaborate on that last point, there is a question here about how should we differentiate between legitimate militarism and so-called terrorism? So in other words, how do we know who is moderate, who is not? That the, the, the taxonomy gets very problematic, right? So can you address that kind of question? Yeah, that's that I think in international politics that can be hazy sometimes. Uh, but in this situation, there's never been a clear instance in which, um, you know, this wholesale attack on civilians in Israel um, is, uh, it's very clear what that is about. Um, and, um, you know, clearly that's terrorism, different, different political entities allied with or for or against Hamas might characterize it in a different way. Not all entities, not all states characterize Hamas as uh, a terrorist organization, but I believe that they are. Uh, there's not one, one, you know, formula that one can use in different conflicts and different uprisings to determine, you know, who or who is not uh, a terrorist organization. And there's a politics also behind it, right? The U.S., had designated the PLO a terrorist organization, but when the T when the PLO acknowledged Israel's right to exist and for swap for swore using violence, then the U.S. also changed its um, it also uh, changed its classification of the PLO. So so it depends what happens in the political world. All right, so. I want to thank uh, Professor Peskin for this very informative and detailed lecture. I want to remind all of us, since we, we do have to uh, bring it to an end, that on November 12th, this is going to be Sunday at 10 o'clock our time, here Arizona time, 
we're going to have Professor Arya Suposnik from Ben Gurion University continuing the discussion. In other words, we didn't cover everything because it's impossible to cover it all within an hour and a half. And Professor um, Suposnik is going to tell us more about the history of Zionism and how it is tied to the Palestinian Israeli conflict. So do tune in then. I believe that Lisa put in the chat the information about the event, and we are going to sh share the flyer with you and all the information in a separate uh, email that thank you all for joining us. So with this in mind, I'm going to thank you all for attending this event and for posing good questions in a respectable and respectful manner. And we will continue to explore and learn more about this difficult uh, situation in Israel, in the war between Israel and Hamas, and in the Middle East beyond that. So I wish you all good night, and we'll see you all on November 12th. Thank you. Thank you. Um,